In the last two videos, we've talked about paternalism in medicine. Specifically, it's this idea that physicians can restrict the choices or restrict the freedom of patients as a means of trying to either prevent them from harming themselves or as a means of trying to promote some good for the patient. So we saw, for example, in the Dax Cowart case, you had this patient who repeatedly said they didn't want treatment and physicians continued to give him treatment because they thought it was good for him. They thought it was best for him. So again, in this case, the patient's choice, his autonomy, his decision-making power, all of that was kind of overridden so that physicians could do what they thought was best for the patient. Today we're transitioning to questions about truth-telling in medicine. So we're going to be looking at questions like, should physicians and medical personnel always tell their patients the truth? Are there cases in which it might be okay to omit certain pieces of information when talking to a patient? Or are there even cases in which it would be okay for physicians or medical personnel to lie to patients or to lie to patients' family members? And I think a lot of people might be surprised to hear that truth-telling in medicine is something that's up for debate. Generally speaking, I think a lot of people will just assume that physicians should just always be honest. They should always tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth to their patients. But there are a lot of complicating factors that might limit the ability to tell the truth or there might even be situations in which it would be a good idea to not tell the truth. And so we're going to be looking at that today. The essay that was assigned for this particular class is Mac Lipkin's essay on telling patients the truth. And Lipkin makes the argument that physicians really shouldn't be expected to tell their patients the truth all the time. For Lipkin, there are going to be lots and lots of cases in which it's actually okay for physicians to not tell the truth. And so I'm just going to talk through some of the main arguments of Lipkin's essay, and then we'll look at some problems for it as well. To start, I think there are two major claims that Lipkin is defending in this essay. The first is that there are cases in which it would be permissible for doctors to avoid telling their patients the truth. And the second is there are cases in which it would be permissible for doctors to deceive their patients. So the first claim is weaker. It's just saying there are cases in which it would be okay to not tell the whole truth. Maybe you omit some piece of information, but you're not actually trying to deceive the patient. The second is saying there are going to be cases in which it's actually okay for physicians to actively work to deceive patients. The first one, though, is just saying maybe there are going to be cases in which not disclosing the truth is okay, like withholding information from a patient, maybe that's okay in a given situation. So the first question is really about whether it's okay to withhold information, to leave information out when you're talking to a patient, and the second is about actively lying to a patient or actively trying to deceive them. For each of these claims though, Lipkin gives a series of arguments, and so there are three arguments in support of the first claim and two arguments in support of the second. We'll start with the first claim then, that it's sometimes permissible for doctors to avoid telling their patients the truth. Three arguments in support of this claim are the impossibility argument, the uncertainty argument, and the patient's request argument. The impossibility argument is really the most important one, I think, for Lipkin's essay, and here he's going to argue like this. It's often impossible to tell patients the truth. If it's impossible to tell patients the truth, then there are going to be cases in which it's permissible for doctors to avoid telling the truth. And so it just follows, there are going to be cases in which it's permissible for doctors to avoid telling their patients the truth. So this is a situation where if the first two statements are true, the third statement has to be true as well. We can look at that second statement to start. If it's genuinely impossible for a physician to tell a patient the truth, then we can't expect them to do that. In other words, we can't expect people to do impossible things. So if there are really cases in which it's actually impossible to tell a patient the truth, then of course it's going to be permissible to not tell that patient the truth because the physicians can't do otherwise. So the second statement is going to be really hard to argue with. Again, it just means we can't expect people to do the impossible. If it's really, truly impossible to tell a patient the truth in a given situation, then physicians cannot be expected to tell the truth in that case. That means this argument really hinges on the first statement. The first statement is the one that Lipkin has to prove. And that is this claim that it's often going to be impossible to tell patients the truth. So if that first statement ends up being correct, it looks like Lipkin's argument is going to work. So why think that it's often impossible to tell patients the truth? For Lipkin, this might have a lot to do with various patients' educational backgrounds. 
So a lot of patients aren't going to have any sort of formal medical training, and so different terms mean different things to different people. Take, for example, the word tumor. That word is going to mean different things to different people. Some people are automatically going to assume tumor means cancer, and so they're going to be really upset if they hear that they've been diagnosed with having a tumor, whereas other people are going to recognize that a tumor is not necessarily cancer. There are such things as benign tumors, and so even if physicians discover that a particular patient has a tumor, that doesn't mean the patient has cancer. But Lipkin's point here is just that the same word, the word tumor, is going to mean different things to different people. If physicians use technical medical terminology, that's either going to confuse patients or they might have the wrong ideas about what it means. So again, you might hear a word like tumor and some people are going to think cancer, some people are going to recognize it doesn't mean cancer, and so the reactions are going to be different across the board. That means anytime you're using any sort of technical language, medical language, you're going to get so many different variations in responses in terms of what patients think that means that there will be some cases in which communicating with the patient is extremely difficult, if not impossible. Now you might respond to that case and say, okay, recognizing that different people have different levels of education, they might have different understandings of what terms mean, that's all fine, but it's still the doctor's responsibility to communicate what the actual diagnosis is and what it means. In other words, it's the physician's job to educate the patient regarding these matters. And Lipkin might say, yeah, that's all fine and well, but in order to really understand what's going on physiologically, you really need a robust medical education, and it's not up to doctors to provide that level of education to their patients. We're not training patients to become doctors themselves. And so for Lipkin, the idea is we're going to have to simplify the truth in lots of ways, put things in layperson's terms, and it, when we do that, it means distorting the truth. So giving a basic, simplified explanation, Lipkin calls this the truth, in quotes, it's not actually the truth because it doesn't take into account all the complexities, the technicalities that come with having a robust medical understanding of the phenomenon. Or to put it in simple terms, Lipkin thinks that simplifications are a distortion of the truth. And so if you think, yeah, okay, a physician doesn't have to train every patient to be a doctor themselves, but they can speak in simplified terms, they can put things in layperson's terms, and that's okay. Lipkin's gonna say, okay, fine, but that's still a distortion of the truth. You're not giving the full story, the full picture. You're not fully explaining what's going on. So just think, for example, of somebody who has migraines or chronic pain, and they're given some sort of pain medication, and the physician says, just take this, it'll help you feel better, it'll help treat your pain. That's kind of a simplified story, but it doesn't go into the complexities of how the medicine actually interacts with the body to block pain receptors or to do various other things. And so by telling a patient, okay, take these pills, they're gonna help, that still counts as a kind of distortion of the truth. It's a simplified version of the truth. It's not the whole truth. And so Lipkin is just saying, these simplifications are fine, and in fact, they're necessary, because lots of patients just aren't gonna be able to understand the whole truth. Now, a key issue here is whether you think simplifications count as distortions or not. That's what this really comes down to. And so there are going to be critics who say a simplification is still true. So a physician who says, take these pills and you'll feel better, that's a true statement, even though it leaves lots of information out. And so there's disagreement between Lipkin and his critics about whether or not the truth requires a comprehensive explanation of everything that's going on or not. For Lipkin, he thinks the truth has to include all the details about what's going on physiologically, whereas his critics are going to say, even though physicians have to simplify the truth to speak with their patients, that doesn't mean they're distorting the truth. So again, the debate is really about, is a simplification still true, or is that a distortion of the truth? One of Lipkin's critics says, He's confusing the difference between the whole truth, which includes all the comprehensive medical information, all the physiological information that explains what's actually going on in a patient's body. That's the whole truth, and he's confusing that with what's wholly true. What's wholly true, that just involves true statements. And so true statements can be simplified statements. As long as physicians are speaking truly, even if they're using simplifications, they're saying things that are wholly true, then that's fine, that's perfectly permissible. But you can still say something that's wholly true, that's completely true, even though you're leaving out lots of information that explains all the phenomenon in play. 
To give an example, you can say things like, it's currently raining outside. That statement might be wholly true, completely true, and you don't need to have a comprehensive understanding of meteorology to understand that the statement, it's currently raining outside, is true. Yes, that statement might be a simplification. It leaves out tons of information that a meteorologist will understand really well, but that doesn't mean the statement is false. It's still completely true. It's just a simplified version of the truth. And so again, the debate comes down to whether or not simplifications are completely true. Lipkin thinks that a simplification is false from a technical standpoint. His critics think simplifications are still true. Simplifications are just a more basic understanding of what's true. Now, if simplified truth is still truth, you might think physicians should always speak the truth whether they have to speak in simplified terms or not. And there might be good reasons for this. You might think that truth-telling in medicine is important because it establishes trust between patients and physicians. If a physician were to lie or distort the truth and the patient finds out about it, that might cause all sorts of disruption in the patient-physician relationship. And so there might be some really good reasons to think that physicians should really try to be telling the truth all the time, even if they have to put things in simplified terms. So let's just set the first argument to the side. That's the impossibility argument. It really comes down to a question of whether or not simplified truth still counts as truth. There's still two arguments that Lipkin gives in support of this claim that sometimes it's all right for physicians to avoid telling their patients the truth. So the second argument he gives for this claim is the uncertainty argument. And it just goes something like this. Oftentimes a patient's diagnosis is likely but not certain. So there might be, for example, a 99.9% .9 chance that a patient's diagnosis is accurate, but there's some chance that a test was a false positive. So patient's diagnoses are not always certain. There's uncertainty in the diagnostic process. But there are going to be cases in which it's okay for physicians to leave that information out. So if a diagnostic test is extremely reliable, the odds that the test is mistaken are just negligible. Physicians are not expected to communicate that information to the patient. So we're imagining this case where it's virtually certain, based on the testing, that the patient has this particular condition, and the physician is just telling the patient, you do have this condition. That's a distortion of the truth, according to Lipkin. It's leaving out some piece of information, namely that it's not absolutely certain that the patient has this condition, but Lipkin's going to say, it's not on doctors to, to share that kind of information all the time. By analogy, think of it like being on a flight. Every single flight has some non-zero chance of crashing. That seems undeniably true. And yet, when you get onto a flight, you don't expect the captain to come on over the intercom and say, you know, it looks like it's going to be smooth flying today. There is some chance that we might crash. Very likely not. But just want to disclose to you that, yes, indeed, there is a non-zero chance that this flight might crash. We don't expect pilots to say that kind of thing even though it's true. In other words, if a pilot talks on the intercom as though the flight's going to go perfectly well, there's not going to be a crash involved, we don't say that they're being dishonest or distorting the truth or anything like that, because we just don't expect them to disclose every single piece of information that's true with respect to this flight. So a pilot that says it's going to be smooth sailing today, we're going to land at this particular time, they're leaving out a piece of information that, yes, there's some chance the flight might crash, but we don't expect them to share that information. There's no sort of obligation that they share that information. In fact, if they did share that information, they might cause a panic. Because it might be the case that when some people hear that there's some small chance of an event occurring, that they mentally inflate that chance, and it seems much more likely than it would have been. So if a pilot were to say, there's some chance that we might crash, yes, that's technically true, but some people are going to respond to that and say, the pilot would only mention that if it were a really good chance, if it were a high chance of happening. Similarly, in the doctor's office, if a physician were to say, it's very likely that you have this particular condition, the diagnostic test, there is a non-zero chance that, you know, something went wrong with the diagnostic test, but we're virtually certain you have this condition. Some people are going to hone in on that small chance that the testing is wrong, and that might promote all kinds of false hope. They might hear that there's a non-zero chance that they don't actually have this condition, and that's just going to consume their thoughts. To the point maybe where they order second rounds of testing, third rounds of testing, fourth rounds of testing, and they're wasting valuable time and resources in many cases, getting these tests that really aren't necessary because we're virtually certain the patient has this particular condition. So just to bring this back to the big picture, 
Lipkin is arguing that physicians can withhold the truth from their patients in certain scenarios. Not in every scenario, not even generally, but there are going to be some cases in which it's okay to withhold the truth from patients. This is one of those cases, he thinks, where a diagnostic test is virtually certain. We don't expect physicians to tell every patient that the test could be wrong. For example, when it's a 0.000001 chance that it's wrong, we don't expect physicians to share that kind of information. And it might actually be bad if they do share that information because patients might become so consumed with the thought that maybe this test is wrong that they end up wasting valuable time, they end up wasting valuable resources continuing to run test after test after test to confirm. So if you agree that withholding that kind of information is a case of withholding the truth from patients, and you think that that's an okay thing for physicians to do, then it seems like you agree with Lipkin when he says there are going to be cases in which it's okay to withhold the truth from patients. But there's going to be a lot to debate here, just like with the first argument. Moving to the third argument, this is the simplest argument that Lipkin gives, and it's just sometimes patients request to not know the truth. Sometimes patients will say things like, if my test comes back positive for this particular condition, for cancer, for whatever, just don't tell me. I don't want to know. And so Lipkin's thought in these cases is, if a patient requests to not know the truth, then it's okay to not tell them the truth. So if a patient says, if the test comes back positive for this kind of cancer, don't tell me about it. I don't want to know. The physician is permitted to withhold truth in that case. Again, if the test comes back positive, what is the physician supposed to do here? Do they go against the patient's will and tell the patient anyway? Or do they say, you know what, I'm going to honor the patient's autonomy. It's their freedom to know or not to know. If they're telling me they don't want to know, that's their choice. I'm not going to disrupt that choice. If you think it's okay for the physician to say, I'm not going to disrupt that choice, I'm going to honor that decision, then this is a clear case of it's okay to withhold truth from patients. Again, it's a very simple argument that just says it's okay to withhold truth from patients when they don't want to know the truth. Now, not everybody's going to agree with that. Some people are going to push back and say, even in cases where patients don't want to know the truth, physicians should still tell them. But that's another debate that we can have, and I, and I purposefully want to leave some of these debates open. So just to recap, we've got this major claim saying that it's sometimes okay to withhold the truth from patients. There's three arguments given for this. The first is that some patients lack the requisite understanding, the requisite educational background to really understand the truth. And so physicians in these cases have to give a simplified version of the truth, which for Lipkin is not the real truth. Whereas for his critics, they're going to say, no, it's still true. It's just a simplified version. So simplifications still count as true. That's one debate. So one debate is, do simplifications of the truth still count as true? The second argument said that there are cases in which there's uncertainty in the diagnostic process where we think something's extremely likely to the point where disclosing the chances of it being wrong are just not worth doing. It's just going to cause panic or false hope. And so in those cases, physicians can withhold that information from patients. We don't expect them to explain every single detail, all the odds, all the probabilities to their patients. If something is likely enough, it's okay for the physician to just say, here's what the test showed. So that's another debate we can have. Is it the physician's responsibility to disclose all the probabilities in the whole process of testing and treatment? Or is it okay for physicians to kind of round up on the numbers? So if a test comes back and it's virtually certain that a patient has a condition, is it okay for physicians to round that up to just saying you have this condition? And if so, that's withholding some truth, that's withholding the fact that there's this infinitesimal chance that the testing is wrong. But the question is whether or not that's okay to do. Can physicians withhold that or not? And Lipkin thinks, of course they can. It's obvious that they can. We don't expect physicians to just bombard patients with all the probabilities all the time. And then the third argument, this idea that sometimes patients just don't want to know the truth. Lipkin is saying, in those cases, of course the physician is permitted to withhold the truth. We can debate about that. Is it the case that physicians should just tell patients anyway, violate the patient's autonomy in the name of telling them the truth? Because you might think that patients require that information in order to make good lifestyle choices and good choices about their medical care. It could be the physician's responsibility to tell the patient the truth, even if the patient doesn't want to hear it, for the sake of trying to promote what's good for the patient. 
And so here we've got this kind of paternalistic idea entering in where the patient says, I don't want to know the truth. So autonomy is telling us, don't tell them the truth. Whereas the physician thinks they have to know the truth in order to get the treatment they need. So we're going to tell them the truth for their own good. That's honoring the principle of beneficence at the expense of autonomy. So again, it's this paternalistic idea of do we do what's good for the patient even though it violates their free choice, or do we honor their free choice even though it means not doing what's best for the patient? So these all raise interesting questions that we need to discuss. I'm going to move on just for the sake of time to the second major claim, and that is there are cases in which it's permissible for doctors to deceive their patients. So now we're moving from questions about withholding information and, and simplified speech to Questions about actively deceiving patients. This can include misleading patients or specifically lying to them. And Lipkin thinks that sometimes that's okay. And there are two major arguments that Lipkin gives for this, this claim that it's sometimes okay to actively deceive patients. The first is going to be based on an argument from placebos, and the second is an argument from patient benefit. So we'll just talk about each of these. So looking at the first argument from placebos, placebos, it's, it's a hard word to define, but the basic idea is it's an inert substance. It's a substance that just doesn't really do anything. And so a classic version of placebo is like a sugar pill. And so it's this idea of we're giving them something that in and of itself doesn't do anything to treat the condition, but it kind of tricks the person into feeling better, or tricks the person's body into healing itself at a, at a faster rate without actually doing anything directly. And I recognize that's a super oversimplified way of talking about placebos, but again, it's kind of a hard term to define carefully. That being said, placebos are sometimes extremely effective. Now, if that's true, that placebos are often very effective, then Lipkin thinks doctors should be allowed to use them. In other words, why wouldn't we use a treatment, even if it's giving a patient an inert substance? Why wouldn't we do that if it stands some chance of benefiting the patient? The problem, though, according to Lipkin, is that placebos require some level of deception. So physicians, when giving out a placebo, it's going to be more effective if the patient actually believes that this is not an inert substance. So if you tell the patient, this is a placebo I'm giving you, it doesn't actually do anything, that's going to be less effective than telling them, here, take this pill and you'll feel better. So Lipkin thinks that placebos require some degree of deception. Placebos, if patients know it's a placebo, are going to be a lot less effective than a placebo where a patient genuinely believes that this is directly helping their condition or problem. So to put it in a concise way, placebos require deception because patients have to mistakenly believe that it's going to directly address their problems when in fact it's not actually going to directly address their problems. But again, since this is extremely beneficial, Lipkin's argument is we should allow doctors to use placebos even though we're tricking patients into thinking that this is a direct treatment to their problem, when in reality it's, it's an indirect treatment, Lipkin thinks there's nothing wrong with that. Because again, physicians are trying to promote the health of patients. The key debate with respect to this argument, though, is whether or not placebos require deception. Because a physician might prescribe a treatment that's completely inert, but they can still say very vague and general things like, take these pills once per day and you're going to feel better in two weeks. Even if this is a placebo and it's an effective placebo, the physician's not saying anything that's false. Taking these pills will help the patient feel better, but the way in which it works is deceptive. So the physician is leading the patient to believe these are going to directly address the problem, whereas placebos work in kind of an indirect way. So the physician is kind of masking how this is all working, but what they're saying is still true, even though the physician's not disclosing all the information about how the pills work. So again, the key question here is, do placebos require deception? And that's something that I want to debate. The second argument that Lipkin gives in support of this second major claim, so the second major claim is, it's sometimes okay for physicians to actively deceive their patients. The second argument he gives for that claim is the argument from patient benefit. And so just very generally, he says, sometimes deceiving a patient benefits them. And so if our goal as doctors is to try to benefit our patients, then we should use deception whenever it's going to benefit the patient. So one case that we're going to look at in our next synchronous meeting is a situation where two people were infected with coronavirus and one had passed away, one was still struggling to survive, and physicians kept telling the survivor 
that their family member was okay, that they were doing fine, that they were recovering. And so they're actively deceiving, they're actively lying to this patient. They're saying your family member is fine when in fact the family member had passed away. But the idea was if they were to tell the patient the truth, this might put the patient's life in danger. So the patient's already struggling to survive, they're fighting to survive, and the physicians decided we can't tell them the truth right now because if we were to tell them the truth, that might impede their ability to fight for survival at this point. So we're going to just keep lying to the person because we want them to try to keep fighting to survive. Whether or not that's a morally permissible thing to do or not, we're going to talk about that in our next meeting. But the idea is simple enough. These physicians thought you can actively lie to a patient. You can tell them something that's blatantly false for the sake of trying to promote their health, for the sake of trying to help them survive through a very difficult crisis. And Lipkin seems to think the same thing. If lying to a patient is going to promote their survival, whereas telling them the truth, that's going to be a detriment to their health or their chances of survival, then you shouldn't tell them the truth. You should lie to them. This is something that's sometimes called therapeutic privilege, where the physician is privileging certain information or actively lying to patients for the sake of trying to benefit the patient. And again, it's extremely paternalistic in the sense that you're acting to honor the principle of beneficence, you're trying to promote well-being at the expense of telling the patient the truth and letting them live their life or make their decisions according to what's actually true. So you're kind of hiding them from the truth in the same sort of way that sometimes parents might hide their children from the truth. So parents might not let their young children watch the news when there's all sorts of very disturbing stories on the news. You're kind of hiding them from the truth because as the parent, you know what's better for the child. The same sort of thing is going on in medicine where we might hide the truth from patients or actively lie to them for the sake of trying to help them, to try to benefit them. And so this is the final debate that we can raise of is it okay to lie to a patient in order to benefit them or not? So that gives us a lot of material that we can discuss. But just to recap, we looked at this argument from Lipkin. He gives two major claims. The first is that there's cases in which it's permissible for doctors to avoid telling their patients the truth. The second is that there's cases in which it's permissible to actively deceive or lie to patients. For that first claim, we looked at three arguments, the impossibility argument, the uncertainty argument, and the patient's request argument. There are all sorts of questions that arise with respect to each of those. Then for the second major claim, this claim that it's sometimes okay for physicians to actively deceive or lie to their patient, this hinged on two different arguments. One is an argument from placebos that says, Placebos require this level of deception, and placebos are so beneficial that we should allow physicians to deceive their patients in these cases. And the second was just more generally, sometimes lying to a patient is actually for their own good, and so we should allow physicians to lie to patients, or deceive patients at least, when it's for the patient's good. And so rather than resolve the questions that arise with respect to each of these arguments, I'm just going to turn it over to the discussion board and see what you have to say, see what you think about each of these types of arguments, which arguments do you think work, which ones are not really convincing, and we'll just discuss it there.